viewers and welcome to this very special edition of BQ Conversations and I have a very special guest with me. Mr. Birosha Godrej, he's the chairman of Godrej Properties. He's joined me right now from the headquarters of the Godrej Group, Godrej One. Birosha, thanks very much for taking out the time and having this special conversation with me. Before I get into, uh, you know, and deep dive into what, what Godrej Properties' vision is and, and what's happening uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, let's talk about the overall scheme of things with regards to the landscape of real estate in India. I mean, you being one of the prime developers have seen many cycles. How do you think uh, real estate in India is poised to grow now? First of all, great to be with you, Devi, and take this opportunity to wish you and all your viewers a very happy year. Very happy year, yes. Um, you know, I think the, the, the real estate sector is, uh, is always a sector that is very cyclical. Um, and I, I think that is a feature of the sector that has uh, proved quite consistent both here in India and globally. And I think we should therefore expect that to continue. But I think within that cyclicality, structurally, India is now in for a few decades, we think, of a very strong performance in the real estate sector. And the reasons for that are fairly clear. I think um, while we're going through a bit of an economic slowdown at the moment, overall, I think India is at a place now where we should expect reasonably strong economic growth, not just for the next few years, but really for the next few decades. And with that, what we expect to see is you know, highly increasing disposable incomes. And the first things people want to purchase once affordability for it is achieved is real estate. We should also expect to continue to see things like urbanization. Um, we're still largely a rural country, and as uh, the economy develops, as per capita incomes rise, you will see increasing number of Indians shifting into cities, as has happened in every other country that has gone through this stage of growth. Also things like nuclearization of families, where people uh, move from joint families to single uh, families. So I think all of this, um, we think, creates a, a very positive environment for the sector. So at the individual developer level, it's really about being able to make sure you're able to withstand the uh, cyclical slowdowns that are also a feature of the sector. And, and, but, but really, the longer term opportunity is what we think is a very exciting thing and is, is here to stay. So you, you're talking, when you say long term, how many years down the line? Because at least at this point, very difficult to pinpoint green shoots. We're talking about advanced GDP numbers at 5%, disposable income not all that high right now, uh, you know, a backseat taken for high ticket purchases and capital expenditure by families. So when we're talking about positivity, it seems to be a little long drawn. Yes, no, I think um, this is the, the sort of sector where timing um, and predictions about timing usually go uh, pretty but it's hard. been a lull for some time now. That's it has been. I think really it's been a down cycle probably from about 2013. So we're talking now about six, seven years of slowdown. I think, you know, by now I would have actually expected things to improve. But you've had, from a sector's perspective, one shock after another, whether it was things like demonetization, the introduction of GST, the introduction of the Real Estate Regulatory Act, the NBFC liquidity crisis. And now uh, you've got a more general slowdown in the, the Indian economy. Um, so I, I honestly don't have a, a great assessment of whether it's going to take six months, 12 months, 18 months, uh, or even a little bit longer for things to turn around. I think what we think we can say with a high degree of confidence is that over the medium to long term, which I would describe as kind of three to seven years, um, it's with a very high level of conviction that we would expect uh, a strong turnaround. And that again, we're not looking at the turnaround as something that will last again in two years and then you'd be in another slowdown. Really, we're talking about a structural growth story that's going to last 20, 30 years. Within that, you will have periods of uh, you know, more positive momentum and greater slowdown. But overall, I think the momentum will be very strong. And if you look to countries like China that have been, you know, have started their economic reform process uh, 12, 15 years before India has, and you look at kind of the way they have urbanized, look at the way their uh, real estate sector has performed, I think there's quite a lot of optimism that one should expect, but not in the kind of very immediate future, but rather with a slightly medium to long term outlook. But, you know, you as Godrish Properties has managed to weather this storm pretty Okay, I would say you've done well for yourself uh, in terms of your pre-sale numbers, in terms of uh, uh, being one of the leaders in terms of value of sale uh, from the listed space at least. Consolidation is what we're seeing across the board for real estate uh, amongst the larger players such as yourself. And that's, uh, do you feel that that is something that is going to be a key positive 
for larger players, this consolidation that we're seeing in the industry? I do. You know, I think the, the, the industry today is, is, is probably more fragmented than it needs to be. I think if you look at it, Credi, which is the real estate association in the country, has over 10,000 members. There are very few industries anywhere in the world where you'd have 10,000 different uh, players involved in it. Even if you consider many of those as smaller, mostly inactive players, you have many hundreds of uh, real estate developers across the leading cities. Um, we now, if you look at it, at least amongst the listed players, have been the largest developer over the last few years on the residential side by, by booking value. Um, and we estimate our market share as, as, as under 2%. And really, again, that speaks to kind of the level of fragmentation. So I think our goal is to considerably move that number upwards. And therefore, we have really two things that we think can create a lot of value for Goodrich Properties. One, as I described, we think we're in for, while there is a lot of short-term pain, a medium-term outlook that's extremely robust. So we do think this is an industry that will get its mojo back, that will go back to growing at 15 20% a year in the not-too-distant future. And that clearly gives us an opportunity to participate in the sectoral growth um, that, that, that comes about. But I think the bigger, especially in the short term opportunity, is really to focus on growing our market share. So even if the industry itself doesn't grow over the next couple of years, because of the pain many other developers are facing with the liquidity crisis, because customers are, tend to want to work with or, or buy from only the leading developers, particularly in a weak situation like this, because funding is very tight for the majority of the sector, there's a big opportunity to gain market share. And I think clearly in the near term, that's the biggest focus for us. We do think that we've done a reasonably good job of that over the last two or three years. But honestly, I think the opportunity to accelerate that market share gains is uh, is before us. And I think it's up to us to now seize that opportunity. And that's a volume play? Number I, of launches? I, I think so. I think, you know, we're, we're not saying that we want to focus only on affordable housing. I think we, we will have affordable housing and particularly mid-income housing as the biggest part of our portfolio. But even in more premium housing, I think there is a big opportunity uh, for the more established players, for the larger players with stronger balance sheets to, in each geography, grow their market share. And I think that will be uh, our endeavor. And certainly that will involve kind of more investment in the near term, uh, more launches. We've already seen some of that. And I think we've anticipating this current situation have also tried to ensure that our balance sheet is in a position where we can deploy the kind of capital we'd like to do. So we've we've actually over the last 18 months or so raised about uh, 3,000 crore of equity, uh, which we think allows us to put five 6,000 crore of fresh investment into new projects, which is far more than we've done in the company's 25 year history. Um, and again, we think can can lead to quite strong momentum on the business development side, which of course would then be followed on the sales launch side. Right. You know, this is an industry which rewards players who know their markets and their geographies really well and they excel in, the, in those particular pockets. But the environment is such where uh, stress markets can prove to be an opportunity. Do you think you want to expand out of your already stronghold markets like Bangalore, Pune, NCR and Mumbai and look to other stress markets where it could be uh, you know, low-hanging fruit now? Yeah, you know, I think it's a bit of a time frame question, Devina, because for us, there is so much opportunity currently in these four cities that we're in. And if you look at it by value, we think these four cities contribute uh, to almost two thirds of the value of real estate sold in the whole country. So increasing the depth of our presence in these four markets does actually allow us to address a very significant part of the overall market. Um, and therefore, I think over the next two, three years, really, the focus will be on expanding within these cities, trying to establish leadership positions within these markets. Um, and beyond that, though, if you're talking about a more uh, sort of medium to long term perspective, we certainly do think adding new markets will be part of the strategy. OK, uh, so let's talk about uh, you know, what we've got in terms of uh, the overall momentum right now for uh, uh, the real estate market, luxury versus uh, affordable. Now, we spoke to uh, one of your peers, uh, Mr. Mr. Lodha, and uh, he, you know, he spoke about uh, the inventory offtake in the luxury market being a little staggered right now, but he expects it to really pick up because there's not too much of new inventory that is coming in the luxury market space. You know, all your new launches seem to be within that space, not too much in terms of the affordable housing. We'll come to that in a bit. So do you feel that there's been an issue in the luxury market because that's the one that's taken the hit? 
You know, actually not too many of our projects are in the luxury space at all. So I'd say the vast majority of our projects are in the mid-income space. We do have some projects in what I would call the more premium space, so the sort of area between luxury and uh, more mid-income. But we, we actually have consciously throughout the company's history really focused more on this mid-income development. And that is where most of our projects have come and I think will continue to come from. Depending on the micro market in question and whether we are confident of the kind of supply demand dynamics and the fact that we have an idea that we think would work. So for example, if you look at the, the lower parel belt in Mumbai now, it's clearly oversupplied, yes. but that doesn't mean that Godrich Properties couldn't do a project there. I think we would just have to be confident that we have a, a, an offering for a customer, whether through pricing or through the format of uh, apartment size, that is disruptive to the market and therefore would succeed even in a slow market. Yeah. There has to be US speed. Exactly, exactly. But I think you know our, our, our project portfolio has always been skewed more towards mid-income housing. And I think that I expect will continue going forward as well, because that really is where the bulk of demand in a growing country like India is. A year back or so, uh, you know, when you were talking to uh, my colleague uh, and he asked you this question about commercial real estate and residential real estate, uh, you tilted more towards residential real estate being the big play. But off late, it looks like commercial real estate has suddenly started to garner a lot more favor. Do you think that trend will continue? You know, I think it, 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 it's a great question. And I think, again, both uh, both of these classes of real estate go through their own cycles, right? So commercial real estate, after the downturn in 2008, took much longer to recover than residential real estate did. Uh, by 2010, residential real estate was already starting to do quite well again and, and, and did well for a few years. Commercial real estate only started recovering in 2015. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason the cyclicality in the sector exists is that when things are good, everybody creates supply, and that ends up often being too much supply. Oversupply. And then when it, you know, when that position gets reached, uh, you enter a downturn, and people get very pessimistic as they are in residential real estate uh, today. And then you don't have new supply getting created, and as and when the demand absorbs current supply, you get into an undersupplied period, which then leads to the next boom. So I think that fundamental reality is something that at least we feel should just be accepted. So that n neither of these asset classes are going to just grow in a very linear manner without any cycles, that both residential and commercial real estate um, will go through these cycles. I would say that commercial real estate today is more kind of midway through the cycle, that the recovery um, has been on for a few years, will probably continue for a few more years, but then will again go into the other end of the cycle. On the other hand, residential is you know, towards the, the bottom of the cycle. Now, unfortunately, timing when that bottom really hits bottom uh, is something that's very difficult to do. It's and then it'll grow exponentially. It, 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 it'll it, overtake. Exactly. I think that you know, the, there's very gradual movements in the sector never tend to play out. They, they are quite abrupt. They are quite strong. Um, it's also up to each company to decide you know, what its strategy is, what its core strengths are. And I think we've decided for Godrich Properties that it's not that we don't think there's a big opportunity in commercial real estate. There clearly is. And in fact, as a group, we're looking at interesting avenues of playing that through our real estate private equity arm, et cetera. And even Godrich Properties currently has some small investments in commercial real estate. But clearly, our bet is that given our brand, given our geographic presence, given our capacity to invest now when the market is uh, struggling, that the opportunity for Godridge property is, is disproportionately strong in residential real estate, and that's where we'd like to really uh, sort of go all in, so to speak. Um, and I, there's nothing that's changed about my assessment, uh, where, if anything, redoubling uh, on that bet. We've, as I mentioned, raised some capital earlier this year to exactly yeah. um, you know, uh, enable ourselves to, to move even more strongly um, on the opportunity we currently see. And we do believe that a counter-cyclical investment strategy in a sector like real estate, which is a long duration cyclical sector, makes a lot of sense. Because you don't want to be uh, you know, trying to make investments when every developer is doing the same thing and therefore pushing up values. You want to be able to invest when others are a little bit uh, nervous, when others are a little bit worried about the future, because again, 
Um, our fundamental belief that India's economy will do well in the real estate sector yeah, structurally Yeah, because if you're aiming well. to go to a $5 trillion economy, uh, you have to have all guns glazing, right? Exactly. And, you know, I think the, the, the cyclicality of this sector is always something people question, which, again, is what leads to it, because people try to make arguments that this time is different or for some reason the good times won't come or the bad times won't come, and that almost indefinitely proves wrong. You know, anecdotally, I, I, I've seen that every single skyscraper ever delivered anywhere in the world has been delivered in a downturn because these kind of projects are conceived of in good times. And by the time it takes to actually deliver, inevitably the, the cycle turns. So I think we're quite confident in the bet that the, the cycle will turn. Frankly, whether it turns in a year or two years, uh, we, we have very little uh, little confidence in, in that assessment. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, let's talk a little bit more uh, about the cash flow situation. It's industry as an industry, it's, it's a lumpy nature uh, with regards to cash flows. You've spoken about doubling your ROEs to 20%. Are you on track with that? We think so. You know, I think time will tell. Again, this is a this is an industry where the best laid plans can <laughs> can go quite awry. Um, so I think you know it, it, it. That is our target. That is what the the team is uh, gunning for. That is what the team's incentives are based on. Whether or not we achieve it, I think uh, we'll have to let uh, you know the actions speak uh, louder than words. Hopefully, uh, but I think certainly we do believe that executed well and with a little bit of support from, from the market, that that is, is something we're on track to achieve. So investors look for visibility of growth. Paint a picture for us, Godrej Properties, three, four years down the line. Is it an investor's, uh, investor's play? An investor will not be disappointed investing in Godrej Properties. Again, you know, I think certainly the opportunity that's before Godrej Properties we believe is an exceptionally large one. I think um, from a Godrej Group perspective, uh, we're extremely excited about the potential in the company. It is, we believe, one of the fastest growth opportunities across uh, you know, the many businesses uh, we have as a group. I think the, the opportunity is fairly clear, right? As I mentioned earlier, the sector is one that, unless something very unexpected happens, should see pretty rapid growth. Within that uh, rapid sectoral growth, the opportunity for consolidation and market share gains is also fairly obvious. Um, I think history speaks to the fact that the cycle will change and that will also provide further momentum. Um, then what you're left with is, is Godrej Properties, you know, and is the team, uh, that, that we're, we're, uh, is the team in Godrej Properties able to capture that opportunity? Because the opportunity clearly is there unless something very unexpected happens in the macro environment or in the real estate sector or the overall Indian economy. And certainly I think um, you know, the, the team at Godrej Properties, um, myself included, is extremely excited to be at this kind of moment where you have this opportunity to deliver something uh, that's quite exciting and, and disproportionate. Uh, we're doing our very best to set up the capabilities, set up the systems we need to, to capture that kind of growth. Um, and we're confident of achieving it. But, you know, again, uh, time will tell because this is a sector where, where, where it, you know, it's quite dynamic and lots can happen. Yeah. Okay, so uh, a few quick quest questions back to back. Uh, your funding uh, rate last year was somewhere around 7.8. Has it changed a lot in this environment? It's roughly, you know, it, it stayed in a pretty tight band. I think uh, it, it's at about 8% right now. Okay. Uh, let's talk uh, about the ac accounting norm change, revenue recognition. Does that happen uh, in the upcoming year? Or? So what that has done is, is, is pushed out revenue recognition for all projects. So the way to think about it is that all revenues that would have been recognized under the old system this year will now sort of be recognized two years from now. Similarly, what would have been recognized next year will now be recognized two years later. Any internal targets with regards to uh, you know, the kind number of launches that you want to look at, the, the amount of uh, square feet that you want to sell? Well, look, if you, you know, working backwards, I think the, the main number, main financial target we've set for ourselves and even communicated externally is the 20% ROE target. If you work backwards, that involves a 4, 5x earnings multiple requirement over the next three, four years. I think you, you, know, you can work backwards to say that the scale of the company's operations and the profitability both need to show considerable movement in the next few years. Okay, now since I'm here with you, I, I, I'll just ask you, uh, and, and that's uh, you know, going to be one of my last few questions, is what's, uh, you know, you got RK Studios. What's, what's, what's happening there? 
You know, it's a it's a it's a project we're obviously super excited about. I think it's a rare opportunity uh, to be part of kind of developing something that really is, um, you know, the, a part of the city. So much legacy. history to it. It's, just, it's remarkable. It's it's actually probably the smallest project that Godrej Properties has done in recent years, but I think one that both internally and externally has has kind of gathered the most interest given the remarkable legacy of the site. And I think we have to make sure we do uh, a credible job, obviously operationally uh, doing well with it, but also making sure that it's a project everyone's happy with. Um, it's a project that people uh, you know, think is fitting uh, off the legacy of that site, where actually we've made good progress. So that was a, a project we acquired within this financial year. We're qu quite hopeful of launching it within this quarter itself. Um, and it, you know, again, it's one that uh, we're all very excited about, and I think uh, are, are grateful to have the opportunity to develop. All right, uh, and best of luck for that. Thank you. My last question is regarding, uh, uh, you know, this uh, JV model that you do you follow. Do you feel that while this model has worked beautifully for you, it still makes sense to aggregate some land bank? We don't think land banking per se, which I would define as adding land parcels that we have no intention of immediately developing. We don't think that makes sense because really, if we're trying to develop a model that can sustainably deliver an ROE of 20%, we can't have dead assets sitting on the balance sheet. We need to be churning our capital very effectively. That said, that doesn't preclude us from buying land because if we're saying that you know, the market has gotten to a point uh, where developers are extremely stressed and are willing to sell land at deeply discounted prices and we believe we can immediately start developing that land and earn that kind of return on it, we'd be very happy to, to buy the land. Um, but I don't think we, you'll see Godrich Properties buying any land that we say that you know we'll come to developing five years from now because again that's just not the fit with the, our stated it's objective. Just a dead investment for that people. I, exactly, and we're not you know we don't aim to earn um, uh, earn capital from uh, the long term value enhancement of land because we think that's kind of a speculative bet. We really want to earn. Uh, capital from the development that we're bringing to bear. And again, to have the kind of ROEs we're targeting, it cannot be done with, with land banking. So we certainly might see Godrich Properties invest in purchasing land, but all of that will be land that we intend to develop immediately. Okay, last question. You maintained a very steady uh, pace of launches. Uh, you're looking at, you recently just announced four, um, you're talking about RK. What's more, what, what more lies in the pipeline? If you could just give us a, a color of that. You know, I think, Vivian, it's important to remember that we, we've raised this 3,000 crore all in the last um, uh, 18 months, really. You really haven't seen yet the launches that are going to come from the investment of that capital. And as I mentioned, that capital is alone more than the companies invested in its entire history. So I think we're quite clear that business development is the biggest priority for the company over the next 12 months because this period is a period of unique opportunity given the liquidity crisis, given that we are confident both of the balance sheet and our capabilities to scale at this moment. Um, so we're, we, we expect to see strong project additions, which will be the first step. And then as those projects get launched, uh, we think there'll be significant traction on the launch side. Uh, you know, our expectation again is to pretty significantly scale the company from these levels, and to do that, we'll clearly have to. 2020 will be the year for that. I hope so. I hope so. Again, you know, it's a, it's a, it's it's sometimes an industry that can be quite frustrating in terms of the pace of regulatory approvals and other things. But certainly, we all uh, get up and excited to make sure 2020 is that year. And uh, we wish you all the luck for that, Prasha. Thanks so much, so much for joining me in this conversation. Thanks very much. It's great to have this chat.